Man, it is so good to to join in together with fellow brethren. Now for I, you know, I don't know how many weeks we've been doing this, but it's been so cool to worship with you know you Dale John and Uncle John, like like rehearsing for this moment about 30 seconds ago. <laughs> Just felt like, okay, God, do not cry, Jared. <laughs> through this next set like just do not do it and a lot of people at home don't know that you know sometimes they know we pre-record a lot of our uh, online services well especially the worship part uh, because I can't be there on Sundays so, sometimes like, Keith, Keith does the same thing but we take these moments just as serious as if it were live Right. and at home today we want you to have this moment with us Uncle John can you sing a little bit When peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot, you have taught me to say, hallelujah, it is well, it is well. My soul. If you know this, sing it with us. Just say, It is well. It is well. With my soul. With my soul. It sing it Shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up. 
coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Line you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me Oh, the overwhelming Never-ending Reckless love of God yeah. Oh, it chases me down Fights till I'm found in the night I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away, and oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Yeah. Oh, it chases me down.
Welcome to Spring Creek Church Online. My name is Dr. Jessica Fernandez, and I am the online campus and teaching pastor here at Spring Creek Church. Today, we're in the last part of the Call to Community series, Community in the Calm. As we get started, let's pray. God, we thank you for this day that you have given us, Lord. Father, I thank you for the word that you have given us, and I pray that the word may motivate each and every person watching, Father, to be able to uh, be committed to join community or build community. Father, we thank you, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All of my friends on the East Coast of the United States will completely understand what I'm about to say. Every year, the East Coast gets slammed with hurricanes. I lived in Florida around 20 years, and one thing I had to get used to was hurricane season. This is between June 1st and November 30th, where the waters are the warmest and the hurricanes are developed off of the African coast. The Caribbean, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina usually get the brunt of most of the storms, but there are also some storms that sneak right by Florida and enter the Gulf of Mexico. I learned really quickly that you had to prepare for hurricanes. In 2004, we had three hurricanes in a matter of six weeks that hit Central Florida. They were Charlie, Francis, and Jean. Charlie was a Category 4 storm with winds reaching 150 miles per hour. Hurricane Francis landed into Florida's east coast as a Category 2 hurricane. Winds were 105 miles per hour. Only six weeks after Hurricane Charlie and three weeks after Hurricane Francis slammed into central Florida, the area was hit again by Hurricane Jean at 120 miles per hour winds as a Category 3 hurricane. So because we're tough New Yorkers and from the Bronx with zero experience with hurricanes, we thought we've survived the city. So we can definitely survive a hurricane too. We had been in Florida for all of three years. And up to that point, hurricanes were super exciting, but very, very uneventful and very expensive. So we never prepared for them. But don't judge me because I wasn't the only Floridian who did not prepare for hurricanes. You might be thinking, why wouldn't you prepare for a storm you knew was coming? I mean, we usually know most of the details of the storm about seven to 12 days ahead of time. So it's not like we don't have enough time to prepare. We would hear that the hurricane was coming. We would see the forecast and storm tracks. We know the timeline. We know the level of intensity of the storm. And yet we have decided that we know from experience exactly what this storm will or will not cause even though none of us is truly a meteorologist. So we don't prep and we wait until the last minute. As a matter of fact, we had plenty of time to prepare, but since so many storms turned out to be nothing but hype, everyone waited until the last minute, right before the storm, like a day before the storm, to determine if the storm will be a significant sized hurricane like a category two or above. If everyone feels like it's worthy enough to prepare, then everyone runs to the store and they buy all the gas cans, water bottles, canned food, wood to board up the windows, tarps, generators, flashlights, batteries, barbecue grills, charcoal, propane tanks, fans, extension cords, and battery powered radios. And because everyone ran to the store at the same exact time, the shelves were usually completely empty. It was so bad that we would watch Facebook all day. So when someone posted that a store had a new shipment of water, we would immediately get in the car to try to beat every other person in the city and get the water first. Why do we wait until the last minute? Because we've had so many false alarms. Because we've experienced all the hype from the news and weather reports and nothing happened. Do this enough times and the sense of urgency fades fast and news of a storm doesn't seem important anymore. It just becomes white noise. You just continue your routine until you can't any longer and then you ride out the storm. And that routine becomes like a security blanket because it takes your focus away from the storm. It becomes a distraction. Here is where we went wrong in 2004. We were not prepared for the first unwanted, uninvited guest, Hurricane Charlie. So by the time the other two storms appeared, there were no supplies for weeks, even months after the fact. We had all the excuses for not storm prepping. No money, no time. It's not that serious. It's nothing we can't handle. But Charlie hit hard and the other two storms came to finish the, de the devastation to Central Florida. You see, the time to build a storm sh shelter is not in the storm. It's before the storm. 
but we missed it. We became dangerously complacent. Now we hear about a storm coming and we don't even budge and are unwilling to take action because we believe nothing will happen. We don't prepare, we don't buy a thing, and we actually might convince others that this storm is not a threat at all. In this series, Call to Community, I've talked about the importance of community during a crisis. Pastor Jared talked about where to find community and where not to find community. And Chaplain Robin talked about how having an older, wiser friend can give direction to your spiritual life and greater insight into your relationship with God and others. And some of us have heard and have been moved to action to build or join community. And yet, there are probably still some of us who have heard the storm warnings, who have seen all the people around them getting prepared and still refuse to prepare for the storms of life by being in community. Today, I wanna to talk about community in the calm, the time before the storm when life is calm, when you still have time to be and build community so that when the hardest parts of your life present themselves, you have a support system in place who will be your strength and support when you need it most. So the real question is, why are we still not in community? I believe it's because we become comfortable with the mundane and we find excuses not to engage in community because it doesn't fit into our schedule. In the calm of our lives, are we preparing for the storm or have we made excuses for our lack of preparedness and complacency? When we work a 40 hour work weeks, go to soccer practices, clean house, go food shopping, doctor's appointments, church on Sunday, when being in community just doesn't fit in, we become apathetic, showing lack of interest or concern about what is happening around us. I wonder how many of us experience holy apathy because we find security in the routine of our lives. So we become complacent in our walk with Jesus. Our Christian journey becomes a buffet where we pick and choose what works for us and what doesn't. But how do we know when we are experiencing holy apathy? Well, we develop an attitude of self-sufficiency. We believe we can deal with whatever life throws our way on our own. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 warns us, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him and He will make your path straight. We are experiencing holy apathy when the culture in which we live doesn't shock us anymore. When we are in alignment with cultural norms and stop spiritually evaluating what's happening around us, we don't care to question what society deems as normal. 1 John 2, 15 through 17, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. We are experiencing holy apathy when we believe that we are spiritually good and we have a false sense of security. Luke 18, 10 through 14 tells us, two men went up to the temple to pray one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other man, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all those who humble themselves will be exalted. We are experiencing holy apathy when we know about Jesus, but we don't walk with Jesus. We can tell people about the greatness of God, but we have no intimacy with Him. Our conversations with Him are few and far between and we no longer seek his purpose in our lives. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my father in heaven 
will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. The thing about holy apathy is that we have no concern, interest, or enthusiasm in our walk with the Lord. And many times we think the only ones affected by our lack of concern is us. But who does our holy apathy affect? It affects the people around us who have been discarded by society, the people who Jesus adores. And when Jesus walked the earth, he loved people like the leper who Jesus touched and healed so that he could be made clean and re-enter society. By Jesus touching him, he himself becomes unclean. People like the tax collector named Levi, who was considered a disgrace because his occupation was compared to being a thief and a murderer. Jesus calls him to be part of his inner circle as a disciple and then eats dinner with him, which was actually more offensive than contact with a leper. People like the bleeding woman who bled for 12 years and lived in solitude with zero human contact for each of those years. Jesus feels her touching him and she is healed. He acknowledged her as daughter when the world rejected her. People like the demon-possessed man who Jesus set free so that he can go home to tell his family of, of how merciful the Lord is. People like the woman at the well who had been married five times and living with the man when she met Jesus. And after talking to Jesus, she believes he, he, he's giving living water and goes and tells her village that, that this could be the Messiah. People like the poor who he chooses to bless. People like children who others saw as pests, but Jesus invites them into his presence, blesses them, and declares the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like children. But who are these discarded people today in our society? Women contemplating abortion or, have had, who, or who have had abortions, single parents, people who earn below a certain income bracket, people with physical and mental disabilities, people who live in what some consider are ghettos and barrios, people who are less educated, people who speak another language other than English, people who are immigrants, people who are undocumented, orphans, widows, elderly, people who are not the right color, people who don't have the right hair color, people who aren't the right height. If I keep going down the list, you'll realize that who I'm talking about is everyone. We are people who have been discarded by society, and yet we are all called into community with each other so that we can love our neighbors the way that we love ourselves. In practical terms, no one ever says, I don't wanna be in community because I'm experiencing holy apathy. I mean, honestly, that would just be weird. But we have lots of excuses for not being in community. After hours and hours and hours of theological and foundational exegetical research on YouTube, I have identified some reasons why people won't join a group. The first reason is there are weird people in groups. And that is true because you're there and I'm there and we're all weird in our own way. Being weird is just another way of saying, I just don't understand you and what you do. Being with weird people is an opportunity to get to know the why and the who about them. People thought Jesus was weird because they were not open-minded enough to recognize that the Messiah had arrived in a way that they just weren't expecting. Get to know that weird person because they could be the most awesome person you've ever met in your life. Another reason is that it's awkward. It will be awkward in the beginning until it's not unless you're just an awkward person. And in that case, you should be used to it already. Anything new is awkward. Embrace the awkwardness because there is growth in it. Another reason people use is that groups are for extroverts. The best groups have a balance of introverts and extroverts. And I personally love groups full of introverts because they let me talk as much as I want to. So if you're an introvert, you don't have to worry because the extroverts will be too busy using up all the oxygen in the room trying to say all their heart's desires. Another excuse is you're too busy. 
Basically, what you're saying is that you haven't made your spiritual growth a priority. How do I know this? Because I've used that excuse myself. And by the time I realized my spiritual life was non-existent because I put things that didn't matter at all over my relationship with Jesus. With modern technology, there are so many ways to connect that no time is not an excuse any longer. Some people say that they can't join a group because they just don't know enough about the Bible. Well, that's why you're there, to learn about God and to learn about the Bible. We are all at different levels in our walk with the Lord, and we all have something to share. Some people don't join a group because they don't want to be emotionally probed, right? We've all been there. You join a group and they start talking or teaching and they turn to you and they start asking questions and what they're asking strikes a chord and you start crying. And the first thing that comes to your mind is, I'm not ready to be vulnerable in front of these people. You don't want your emotions to be exposed, but that is the power of community. Your vulnerability brings healing. And like Pastor Keith likes to say, in order to heal it, you gotta reveal it. Lastly, people don't join groups because they enjoy the status quo. Joining a group involves change and that's too much work. Groups will challenge you and stretch you and that's when growth happens. You might be held accountable by your group and that is so scary. So our next question is, how? How do we do community? Well, I'm glad that you asked that question. If, if, if we learned anything from the Amish community in the first sermon, Community in Crisis, we can start with our neighbors. Maybe it's just letting them know that, that you are there if they need anything. Maybe it's taking their trash can up to the driveway if, if, they, be, if they come home too late. Maybe it's as simple as picking up some trash off their lawn. Maybe it's inviting them over for dinner. And if you're in Texas, then it's definitely all about the barbecue. Maybe it's inviting them over for a game night. Maybe you can offer to babysit one night or, or maybe you can dog sit if they go on vacation. Maybe it's just lending an ear if they're struggling or upset. Maybe it's a Bible study in your home. Maybe you could get together and watch a game, any game. Maybe you could offer to help them with a home improvement project. It really can be that simple. Chaplain Robin talked about the importance of having an older, wiser friend who can give direction to your spiritual life and greater insight into your relationship with God and others. Using what she told us, we can walk out into the lobby and invite one of our chaplains for lunch. We can reach out to our elderly neighbors for coffee and discuss their experiences. You can visit nursing homes, and just spend time with elderly who may have been forgotten by their families. You can bring gifts and necessities to them to show appreciation. You can offer to bring someone to church every Sunday. You can have church with them by teaching them how to put Spring Creek Church online on their television, cell phone, or tablet. You can discuss your sermon with them. Pastor Jared spoke about where to find community and where not to find community. Well, we have plenty of groups here at Spring Creek Church that are ready made, ready for you to arrive and bring all of your pizzazz. Do you like plants? We have a group for that. Do you like cooking? We have a group for that. We have Bible study groups. We have support groups. We have senior groups. We have women's groups. We have men's groups. We have young adults groups. We have common interest groups. And remember all of those people that society discards, but Jesus adores? Maybe God is calling you and me to love them, to, pro to provide support when women contemplating abortion or giving up a child for adoption, to provide community for people with mental and physical disabilities, to single parents, to the poor, to the fatherless, to the motherless, to those who, who don't speak English living in the United States, to the orphans, to the widows, to the undocumented, to the immigrants far from home, to the lonely, to the grieving, to the brokenhearted, to those who are incarcerated, to those who aren't able-bodied, to the broken, to the addicted, to those who feel unloved, to those who feel rejected, and to those living on the wrong side of town. Well, you might be thinking, Pastor Jess, none of these groups are my jam and I don't feel called to do any of these. Well, guess what? That's okay. 
You can create a community that you would thrive in and would love to be a part of. Stop looking for the perfect community and create and cultivate the perfect community for your people. You can host the group with your flavor, with your passion, and God will use you to build community around that passion. You can set the pace for your group and Spring Creek Church will walk alongside of you providing guidance and training and we will be your community. Next Sunday, online, on July 31st, we are presenting great opportunities for you to connect or sign up to host the group. And today and on July 31st at our Garland campus, you can meet our group hosts, sign up to host the group, and you can try out some groups, as many groups as you want. You can go visit, see if it works for you. And if it does, great. If not, try another group. You also will have the opportunity to sign up to be a group, group host. This is your opportunity to find your people, to find your tribe. I wanna leave you with this thought. Last week, we attended the celebration of life of Jerry Bauer, who was a, who was a greeter at Spring Creek Church for many, many years. His beautiful wife, Maria, got up and spoke about her amazing husband. And in the middle of honoring him and his life, she said that it was the support of her community group that gave her strength through this difficult time. It was the text messages, the calls, prayers, and endless amounts of food that showed her how loved and how supported she really was and that she was not alone. Jerry and Maria, by being in community for years and years, prepared for the inev inevitable storms of life during the calm. With that, I wanna ask you, what are you doing during the calm, during your calm season, during the monotony of life to prepare for your next storm? Who will be there to support you when you can't do it yourself? Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day that you have given us. Lord, we thank you for this word. I pray that this word would have touched every single person, Father, and that you may stir up within them, Lord, the desire, Father, to be and build community, Father God. We thank you, Lord, because we know that you have a great plan and a great purpose for each and every person, Father, who is watching this broadcast right now. Father, we thank you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, we will see you during the week at Spring Creek Church online on Facebook. Have a wonderful, wonderful week.